In this episode of the RTS Podcast, we discuss lab experiments gone wrong. Hey everybody, welcome back to the RTS Podcast. Uh, this is our episode number five. Uh, today we've got myself, uh, we've got Adam, Polly, and Matt. Everybody's all here, so we're going to have a pretty good conversation. Today we're going to be talking about uh, training experiments, you know, just kind of all kinds of stuff that we've all tried and observed uh, in our in our time, both as athletes and coaches. So, um, yeah, so just without any, any delay at all, um, let's start off talking about uh, what are some su- some successful training experiments that you've tried before? Um, Polly, we'll have you start off. What do you what have you got in mind? Well, there's a couple of things. I'm, I'm, I'll approach this from my my experiences coaching small groups. Our um, our groups re- generally range from six to ten lifters at a time, and there's some overlap. So one of my um, one of my training concerns is to create a, a, a positive, intense um, training experience where the lifters will actually see um, gains over a, a period of time. And I also have to worry about timing. So experiments, one thing that I've found that has worked really well is using density training, um, putting it in as a finisher, uh, generally speaking, doing some body weight work or lighter work, um, for a period of anywhere from eight to eight to sixteen minutes, for for the lifter just to kind of just polish everything off, if you will, after say a primary and a um, a secondary lift, and it it wasn't always like that. There were times where um, I, I did some programming, and I think the lifters took about two and a half hours to get it through, and I couldn't understand why. And and a lot of that is just kind of um, mental as well. So. So one of the important things is just finding a good balance of exercises per um, per lifting session, so that that they there can be something that they can one lift that they can get themselves psyched up for, and then another they can kind of um, just kind of ease out of, and then the last one that they can kind of uh, finish with. So it's just that's it's it's been an ongoing experiment, but it, it keeps um, it keeps getting better keeps uh, improving and I think you know it shows so you're talking about putting quite a bit of effort then into the uh, into the template thing, yeah yes yeah and and just con- just continuously so so there's, there's something where you know I don't believe for myself you know I, I can't jump and change something sometimes I have to you know too quickly that is and sometimes I have to ride it out a little bit just so I can make sure that I'm not um, you know, being that that programmer jumper, if you will, and just kind of just trying out a lot of different things all at once. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, that's honestly it's probably one of the hardest things that I have to do right now as a coach and a gym owner is to to properly balance the training for all of my lifters. So you mentioned uh, density training uh, for people that aren't familiar with the term. Uh, you, can you describe that real quick? It's it's just uh, you know and and I think I'm gonna throw back something that you you'd mentioned to me a long time ago, Mike. It's just it's um, it's it's really about having a fixed period of time to get as much work in as you can. Um, starting out with a suggested rep range and a suggested in this case it would be in a, a suggested RPE and and just trying to kind of repeat that rep range with minimal um, rest and eventually that rep will break, that rep set will break down and you'll just go down say if you start with eights you'll go down to you know sixes five four threes and you know you might end up with just a bunch of singles and just work through the time work through the time um, something that we um, constantly emphasize and enforce at our gym are um, are, are, is technical failure or technical proficiency in that at that point. So basically, we um, we don't allow crappy reps. So if something's yeah. broken, we're not going to let it continue. So yeah. how much different is that? You know, you're coming from a CrossFit background. How much different is that from, like, say, an AMRAP set? Uh, in my in my and this is directly my opinion. Um, in an AMRAP, it doesn't matter. 
I, I, I've, I've yet to see someone stop themselves because their their form has just just completely gone by the wayside, and they will continue to keep pushing through um, until someone yells time. It doesn't happen like that in our gym. Um, it's it's really about getting in quality reps, and if they need to slow it down and rest a little bit, and and just wait a little bit longer in between um, in between sets, so be it. But the, the the I think the big difference is just the the quality of the work that's put in, and you know for me the feedback is are my lifters staying healthy, um, are, are are people not injuring out, and are they getting stronger? So. Kind of uh, another perspective on that, you know, if the goal is to do the maximum amount of weight, or, or excuse me, the maximum amount of work in, say, 12 minutes or 16 minutes or something, if you, if you do, uh, like, say, a 10 RPE, if you rep out on any one set, you're going to be shot for the subsequent sets. It doesn't take long uh, to realize that the most successful strategy for density type training is to leave several reps in the tank because you can take a shorter rest interval and and maintain a relatively high output you know so it, it I like it because it encourages that you know it encourages you to uh, you know play it smart on any single set you know but you still have to push it overall you know you're pushing shorter rest intervals uh, to me it's it's a strength builder in that it's lifting weights. It's a hypertrophy builder in that you're doing a lot of volume. But the main point, uh, whenever whenever I program it in my training, is kind of as uh, uh, think of it like very specific conditioning work, in that um, you're practicing taking short rest intervals. So uh, the idea is that with enough exposure, you don't need as as long to rest in between sets. You don't need like eight or ten minutes between sets, you can cut that down to four or five minutes, you know, and, and that's a big help when it comes to uh, fitting in more training volume or, you know, recovering between sessions, stuff like that. So, hey, Absolutely. Matt, um, yeah. do you ever, have you ever done density training or program density training? I, I've not heard you talk about it in the past. Yeah, I, um, answer, yes, I have programmed it, and, and you're right, I probably haven't uh, talked much about it. Um, primarily, when I've used it, it's been um, during, um, you know, a uh, hypertrophy phase or training block or something like that, and um, more often than not, as you said, it would be, um, you know, implemented in terms of trying to improve your conditioning and help to increase your work capacity and, you know, re or ultimately reduce the rest between sets and so forth. I haven't used it personally with myself nor my lifters um, on really any of the main movements. We use it primarily for non-specific assistance exercises just because, yeah. to go back to what Paulie said, um, we hold everybody to such a high standard in terms of repetition quality and, you know, technique that we don't want, you know, bad reps to start bleeding into one another and and for sets to start deteriorating. So, um, yeah, for us, it's been just, you know, um, acquiring more work and more and more volume in a, in a much, you know, in a, in a block of time with just non-specific stuff. So I frankly can't comment on it in terms of using it for, you know, any of the power lifts per se. It's all been assistance work. Well, I would, to clarify, Matt. Also, it's like we don't we don't use it for um, the main the main lifts for the for the right. competitive lifts. It's it's really it's it's. I think I think it's we're on the same page with that. Where where we'll yep. use it for assistance work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, say say a push press, for instance. So it's it's a good way to get get some get some work in some hypertrophy work. Kind of you know train people to stay focused. Stay focused yep. and try and maintain their first rep, make it look like their, uh, or make their last rep look like their first rep. That's right. So, um, kind of, kind of on that note, an, an experiment that I've tried that um, seemed to work pretty well um, has been increasing my training frequency. But this is something that gets a lot of press now. But uh, when I first started doing it, it 
took a while for me to figure it out. Uh, it, it's not something that I was able to get right the first time. Uh, I went from, you know, doing like the, the more classic upper lower split. You know, I would train squat and deadlift on the same day and then train bench on the same day. Um, you know, two sessions for each each week, so four sessions total. Uh, when I initially took a stab at, you know, a higher frequency, uh, most of the information I had available was just through um, seeing uh, Coach Shaco's programs online, and nobody was really talking about it um, that much, and if they were, it was more in the sense of, yeah, you couldn't do that if you were, if you were drug-free. You know, and the pendulum has since swung like completely the other direction. Uh, and by and large, I think that's a good thing. But without getting too far off topic, uh, the first time I tried, you know, shifting into a higher frequency, uh, it did not work. Uh, I would say even the first couple times that I tried it, it didn't work. But there was something about it that was interesting. And um, I don't know, I guess I just had a feeling that something was there, you know, um, so eventually, uh, I was able to sustain uh, sustain the workload, you know, and and start sustain it with a higher frequency, and it went really well once I made the adaptation to it, you know, and that was that was the big lesson uh, for me was that um, the devil's in the details, right? So just just because you try it, it seems like a good idea, and you try it, and it didn't work the first time. That might mean it's a bad idea, but it also might mean that there was some detail that wasn't right, you know. Uh, and by changing that detail, it might it might work beautifully the next time. You found that it, find that it was uh, impacted by, like for certain movements, i.e., squat versus deadlift or even bench, because I mean, for a lot of your lifters, you have them bench very very frequently. Right. Um, the way that I had made the transition, um, <laughs> I'd describe it like like tipping over a vending machine. You can't do it all in one push, you know. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like the way that I did it uh, so that it finally worked. Um, I had the, the higher frequency template, and I just tried it, and I stuck with it for about four weeks, and it wasn't going very well. So I went back to my older, lower frequency template, uh, hung out there for four weeks and thought, well, let me try it again. And then the second time I tried it, it went a little better. You know, I may, may have been able to sustain it for six weeks. You know, and then the third time I tried it, I, I was good. You know, I had made the adaptation and I was able to, to stick it out. But, I mean, you're talking about a period of, you know, several months of just working at it and trying to, you know, you beat yourself up and then you heal, and then you beat yourself up again and then you heal up. So uh, just kind of wiggling into that uh, higher frequency. But it did make a big difference. My lifts went up a lot. Uh, muscle mass improved a lot. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a good good thing for my training. How long ago was that? Oh, my gosh. I uh, should have thought of the answer to that ahead of time. But uh, let's see. That would have been. It was probably the year that I beat him. <laughs> <laughs> Which would put no, us back no, to, to, to I'd, I'd already I'd already had my now famous loss to Matt Gary uh, at this time. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, well, I would say I started probably in 2007 sometime, and probably didn't actually make good on the adaptation until 2008. And and Mike just. Um, you know, as far as, say, high frequency versus previous frequency, how would you kind of quantify some of the, say, some of the frequencies? Um, okay. Yeah, good question. Um, so it was still train. so the higher frequency was still training four days a week. Uh, but instead of um, squatting twice, benching twice, and deadlifting twice, it became benching four times a week, uh, squatting, uh, two, sometimes three times a week, and then deadlifting the same two, sometimes three times a week. It really depended on exercise selection. It sounds really so familiar. So for squat, for example, you know, <laughs> I'm doing at least twice a week squatting, but if, if, if you're doing lunges on the, the third movement on the third day, 
and that is that really squatting not not really you know but if you're doing uh, another you know squat variation on that third day then yeah you're increasing that frequency to three times a week and it's it's kind of a similar thing for the deadlift so I guess the squat and deadlift frequency they went up the muscle exposure to um, to training went up though so you know, my leg muscles were exposed to lifting weights now four times a week instead of twice, you know. Then the same with uh, same with upper body pushing muscles, exposed four times a week rather than twice. Uh, in terms of movement patterns, how most people think of it now, I mean, I guess it wasn't ultra high frequency. Um, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? If we go back, gosh, I guess that's about 10 years ago now, um, you know, high frequency was considered, you know, uh, two or three three times a week, you know, now that's, I think people in general, at least on the internet world, uh, think of that as like moderate frequency, and it's not, it's not high frequency unless you're training like six times a week, so uh, it, it's funny how, you know, public opinion changes on issues like that. Right, and kind of building in the intensity as well, so it's, it's you know, what, what one person's, I feel like high frequency at a certain training rate versus uh, intensity rate versus your high frequency at a, 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 a training weight, um, I feel like your your net load is going to be a little bit higher than most of the people out there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. I'm, I think in general, you know, pushing toward a higher frequency is a positive, you know, but I mean, I'm sure it's like anything else. It's there's nothing magical about it. There's got to be a point of diminishing returns somewhere. You know, I'm not sure where that's at at this time, but uh, I'm sure it exists. <laughs> so you talk about your your frequency going, you know, pretty high during that time. What is your volume intensity? You know, what are the fluctuations in volume intensity during that as well? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the volume probably went up just a bit uh, by shifting toward the higher frequency, and I think most of that comes from the warm-ups. You know, by by having to warm up several times uh, right. more during the week than you're you're doing more volume. Like my actual work set volume didn't change by very much. Uh, at least not more until often. recently, you know. So I guess those are some successful experiments. Does anybody have any unsuccessful experiments, any failed experiments that they want to talk about? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go kick first. One out. Uh, yeah, somebody no. has anything they want to share. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think early on we, um, we experimented with, and, uh, and, I, and I know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure Matt's not going to have anything to say about this, but um, say rep outs on uh, on deadlifts. So just oh, here just we, here we go. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> well, you're gonna, you're gonna you're gonna spoil my presentation in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's you know what maybe maybe the, let this be a teaser for your uh, right. <laughs> presentation. Well, you know what there's, not... there's there's really not much else to say that that. I would, I would. Bottom line, I would have to say that that rep outs on deadlifts don't work. It's, it's. I, I have yet to see where that works. Did I just ruin your whole presentation, Matt? I hope not. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Stand up in front of everybody and, and say, "Don't do more than one on the deadlift." Thanks. You all have been great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll be signing autographs afterwards. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so. So, Paul, tell us tell us a little bit more about how you did that. Like, so rep out on the deadlift. You mean like actually, like ten RPE go until you miss kind of rep out? Yeah, you know, it's funny. We were using um, at that at that period. We were we were using uh, an APRE template, which you know, which I I sometimes look at as as hey, say RPE training wheels, and yeah. They, you know, you can APRE template works pretty well for um, for the squat, and it works pretty well for 
the deadlift. I mean, not the deadlift. I'm sorry for the, for the bench, but the deadlift it 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 goes south pretty quickly because then then there's the mental aspect of of people thinking that they have to get a rep out and they have to beat their reps or they have to get a certain amount and they just and 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 frankly it it you know turns into a CrossFit AMRAP where where it's just it's just all about getting in, you know, whatever you can, standing up kind of with the bar, kind of putting it down, but there's no no respect for the movement. Mm-hmm. And and you know, and then then people would start to complain about um, you know, st- like kind of precursor to, to complaining about injuries and such and it just, you know, we 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 took it out pretty quickly. Um but it, it it definitely didn't work. And then and then just kind of affecting recovery for the next couple sessions. Um just kind of a lot of um, a lot of negative repercussions, or at least that's what I've seen um, in our gym with our population. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, let me go back and and add a little bit of context, just in case. So, uh, APRE is auto-regulated progressive resistance exercise, and a lot of uh, people nowadays know that as a plus set, where you uh, take the last set of the day and you rep out with it. And based on your performance, you would adjust the weights for the next week. And that's what you're talking about. Like it's like RPE training wheels that it helps you to to figure out, uh, you know, how to do RPE. It helps you figure out how many reps are in the tank. And it also uh, gives you an auto-regulation benefit uh, by by doing that. So is there is there a solution to that problem? The, I mean, other than just graduating RPE, um, did you find any other solutions? No, that's our, that was our solution. <laughs> it, was, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was graduating to RPE. So, so basically now, you know, they, they have a sense of it, our, our lifters have a sense of it from, uh, from, from using it in other aspects of the training that, that we're doing. And we're just kind of, we slowly kind of slip in, it's just kind of, Slipping in more and more vegetables to into uh, somebody's uh, somebody's diet, where where they they don't even realize that they're starting to understand RPEs more and more. Um, but yeah, we 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 put we just decided to make it a straight RPE. The only place that I will say that we use that we sometimes use the um, um, APRE for deadlift are on very low set APRE. So if a three and the most, if it was an APR three, APRE three and the most you'd go to would be six, that's okay. But on the higher um, APREs, um, it, it, it gets messy real quick. I but, see. So, you, so basically you just don't want to see like 10 rep deadlifts and stuff like that? I mean, if, if, if it looked, if someone could do an awesome set of 10 rep deadlifts, great. But I have yet to see that at, at say an RPE of, of, of seven or above. Um, okay. that, that's, that's where it is. I mean, sure, you can, you can throw um, something real light on the bar and, and just basically do a warm-up, but we're, we're, we want our lifters to be challenged. And, um, right, yeah. So, yeah, in the context of that plus set, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. The plus and deadlifts just is not, is not, a, not a good combination in, in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, so do you tend to, well, I guess that answers the question. I was going to ask you if you uh, still use it in a limited capacity with, like, beginners and stuff. So I guess so. Uh, it just depends on the, the context and the program, which makes sense to me. It is, yeah, it does. And then, and then we have to, it's, it becomes subjective. But just But when people get above a certain weight or... or you know, lifting wise or, or, you know, percentage for them. Um, we, we quickly, or, or a lot of people now, just because of the, our culture in the gym where, where most people understand RPEs here in the gym and, you know, we can, we can pair up uh, a novice lifter with a more um, intermediate or advanced lifter and they'll, they'll help each other out. Um, we're able to kind of just, People just accept that you know when it comes to deadlifts, we're we're just going to um, you know we'll we'll go to an RPE uh, instead of an APRE. Gotcha, that makes sense. Matt, um, 
Do you have any failed experiments you want to share with the with the group? Yeah, I mean, I get, just to piggyback on what Polly said just for a minute before I share some failed experiments. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I I I couldn't I couldn't agree more with Polly and what he said um, with regards to some of these plus sets and so forth because they just like you said it becomes an ego driven you know, exercise, if you will, where you're just trying to simply beat what you did last week. And I don't necessarily know if there's always value in that, particularly if the motor pattern is being negatively reinforced. So, I, I mean, I think AMRAP sets as a whole, especially as of late, and maybe it's just me, but it just seems to me like they've been an overused tool in the in the toolbox. Um, and And that's not to say that they don't hold some value. I just, and again, it's maybe it's in the circles that I travel. I just hear of people using them all the time, every week in almost every training block. And I'm just, in my view, that's not appropriate. It's not what I do with my listers. So it's done for a short season. You know, obviously on, on bench and squat, we would never even cross our minds doing it in the deadlift. <laughs> but... Um, yeah. So anyway, that's just my take on it. I think it's it's an overused m modality um, that that serves to inflate the ego. So um, I'd much rather have my lifter, you know, put the bar back in the rack and do another set with pristine form and technique rather than you know do eight, nine, ten sloppy reps. So, but that's just that's just me. So I'm only speaking for myself, I guess. Well, I mean, I, I think I definitely agree with you uh, in the context of powerlifting. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. just sitting here trying to think about the programming that I write and how many times do we do we actually go to a 10 RPE? Um, yeah, and it's it's just not that often. Uh, and if we do, yeah, if we do, it it tends to be either like an an assistance lift and it's higher reps or if it's a 10 RPE on a competition exercise, then we're talking about, you know, first of all, it's probably not a 10. It's probably a, a 9 or 9.5. And, and we're probably talking about, you know, singles, doubles, sometimes triples, you know, something right. that's a lot more controllable. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think in the context of powerlifting, you know, that technical practice, you know, mastering the movement is is a big deal, you know. Yep. And, uh Keeping that in the forefront of your mind seems to be a common theme among uh, powerlifting coaches. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess in terms of failed experiments, I've got a couple instances that I could mention. Um, the first of which would be the time that Dr. Zordos came into SSPT and wanted to bench first. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, was a, that was a colossal... Um, mistake and a and a net loss on, on his part. Um, wait, wait, a, he wanted to bench first? Yeah, yeah, and I think he laid down on the bench and fell asleep, and I fell asleep watching him, and <laughs> when, when Susie finally revived us both, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was a mess, so <laughs> no benching first. Um, I'm shocked yeah. that he would actually bench first. Uh, it yeah, seems like he must have lost a bet or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, in all seriousness, um, I guess some failed experiences on 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 my uh, behalf would be, um, uh, particularly with some of the deadlift training um, that I've done, has been um, kind of coupling really heavy work in the rack with my normal deadlift volume through the week, and I would say specifically um, just overdoing it in the rack and going to, to maxes at various heights from week to week. Um, I found that, at least for me and, and some of the people that I've tried that with, it's been kind of a failed experiment. I think um, we all know that, you know, um, if you don't position yourself properly when doing, a, you know, a pin pull or a rack deadlift, you're you're doing nothing more than just inflating your ego. Um, you know, we really try to put ourselves 
or mimic the position that we're going to be in at that at that point in the in the movement. So, in, in times past, when we've taken really you know heavy or super max singles in the in the deadlift in the rack, that's that's not ended well. You know, and and to Adam's point, because Adam has been mentioning some of the injuries and stuff that pop up too. I mean, you're just opening yourself up to you know potential injury. So, and, you know, keeping our lifters healthy so that they can train more often with higher workloads is, is of paramount importance. So, um, that hasn't worked well. Also, just experimenting and doing stuff with bands. Um, I've never really felt like the whole reverse bands, you know, did a whole lot, um, other than inflating the ego. And even even bands, even just attaching bands to a movement, I find that they they change the bar path so significantly that we've gotten much better results out of using chains. So it's funny you mentioned reverse bands. That was actually on my list as well. Um, I've, yeah, I've tried it. Uh, just I feel like it's made me worse. Every time I I do reverse <laughs> bands, I feel like it makes me worse. Mm-hmm. I can't. I can't quite figure out why that would be. Like in, in my mind, I can't quite understand it. The only thing that comes to mind for me is that uh, it seems like okay. I mean, obviously, it makes the bottom of the lift easier, uh, but then you add more weight, and that should compensate for it, right? Well, the only thing I can think of is that since it's assisting you off the ground it allows you to, to be a little bit looser in the bottom. And mm-hmm. I think that's a, a really bad habit. I think it's really hard to learn how to get that bottom tightness. And it's it's really easy to get lazy with it. So that's the only thing that, that I've come up with. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the only kind of uh, justification that, I, that I've come up with. Um, yeah. I don't know if it makes sense or not. I was going to say, yeah. Mike, maybe maybe you can program some, um, say, reverse bands with, say, a five-second pause at the bottom just to compensate for the assistance <laughs> of the reverse band. <laughs> right. Well, maybe we should add some chains to it, too, to, to compensate for uh, something else. And... Reverse chains. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> what was it you, you said the other day? I, I can't remember. I read something about you, you know, being very – purposeful in how you program the training in terms of, oh, I'm going to do reverse bands and then add chains. And, oh, it was on the group coaching call, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, people, I think, try to try to do too much when they uh, are picking exercises sometimes. You know, like, oh, I'm going to do a two-board press with chains and, and I don't know, do a, like a, a two-second pause in the middle. You know, or something like that. And most people, to their credit, don't do anything that far out. But even like, you know, two board press with chains. Okay, do do we really need to add chains to that movement? Because every change that you make away from the competition exercise makes it transfer over a little bit less. So, yep. um, you know, basically it's it's people that try to create an exercise that does everything. Uh, one that I used to, to use uh, kind of way back when, I would do deficit deadlifts with chains. You know, So the deficit is to help you work uh, the bottom end of the deadlift and then the chains to help you work the top. Well, why not just do deadlifts? You know, or if you want to work the bottom end, work the bottom end. If you want to work the top, work the top. You know, uh, if you, if you, you know, spend a lot of effort trying to create that magic bullet, then it doesn't really transfer that well. You know, it, you get you get to where you're trying to do too much. You know, so I mean, I guess I could put that in the the column for failed experiments for me. Actually, it, <laughs> my training at the time consisted of so little deadlifting that it it actually worked out pretty well, uh, which is <laughs> which is another uh, you know possibly failed experiment. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and throw that one in there. I, I, I know I've told this story a few times. Uh, I used to do a, a, a ton of good mornings, you know, and this has since gone out of fashion, which uh, is is just as well. 
Uh, but I used to do a ton of good mornings, and I got to where I could do like 500 pounds for five good mornings, which is is really good, you know, except I could only squat about 600 pounds for one. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, man, I'm doing all these good mornings. I got really good at good mornings. I wonder if I did a whole bunch of squats if I'd get really good at squats, you know. Hey, crazy concept, you know, and then you, you try it and it works. But, um, you know, I mean, it sounds stupid now because specificity gets talked about a lot, thankfully, you know. But at the time, the you know, the, the prevailing wisdom uh, was much to the opposite. So I want to bring up an interesting thought I just had on about the good mornings. Um, is it possible that some of your preparation leading up to, you know, being able to, to do good mornings at 500 for that many reps actually helped contribute in the long run to squatting well over 700 like you have? I... I mean, I suppose it had to contribute in some way, right? That, I mean, in the sense that everything that we do contributes to the the kind of athlete and the kind of even the kind of person that you are now. But I'm not sure that uh, that I wouldn't have got to where I was faster if I had trained more specifically. And if you look at at the top athletes of the sport, um, you see them train much more specifically even even not the the very top athletes even if you look at you know just quite good lifters you know they still tend to train with a lot of of specificity and i think there's a lot to be said for that yeah you know it's it, it i doubt that the residual training effect from doing those good mornings lasted uh long enough for me to, to go from being a 600-pound squatter to a 750 squatter or something. It might have helped a bit in the beginning, but, uh, you know, those residuals are going to last for a while, you know, maybe a month. You know, look, if we give it the benefit of the doubt and say even two, three months, six months, well, it takes a really long time to add 100, 150 pounds to your squat. So... <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess we're kind of talking through it just now. I mean, I suppose anything's possible, but I kind of doubt it. I mean, even to take that a step further, right? I mean, it, it, so you are you were able to do good mornings, you know, 500 for multiple reps, and, and that strengthened your back, obviously, and strengthened your posterior chain or whatever, you know, and maybe taught you how to strain in that position. But, I mean, if we if we – took it out even less specific, and let's just say you got good at picking up stones like a strong man, and then you squatted 700. I mean, how responsible is picking up a heavier stone, you know, how much of that goes into you being able to squat 700? Probably none of it. You know, you're just, I mean, yeah, I guess you're a stronger version of yourself, just stronger overall, but there's there's almost zero specificity at all. There's, you know, so it's just the whole transference gets lost. So yeah. I'm glad right. you said strong man, because I've got a perfect <laughs> answer to that. And I, I know he's not here to, to speak up, but Jesse Norris is a big advocate of, of strong man. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and he is arguably one of the strongest guys that's ever lived at his weight, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not, I, I, I would imagine it's not impossible that there's a good amount of transference from the way he trains, but granted, he also does very specific movements too. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before we got started, but I mean, I think we kind of have to come back to the, the Dave Ricks effect uh, to some extent, right? But right. Uh, <laughs> There's people that do a lot of things that, you know, some things are we would advocate for, some things uh, we wouldn't necessarily advocate for. And, um, I mean, there's still strong people that do things to the contrary, you know. Like Matt talked about uh, his failed experiment being, uh, you know, the, the rack pull thing. Well, there's other people that, that have uh, quite the opposite experience. 
uh, one of one of my failed experience, experiments um, being some of my early attempts at, at including singles in my training. You know, well, other people have have been able to make that work, and I even was able to make it work uh, by shifting around some variables. So I think it's one of those things that, you know, there's possibly some benefit to it. The devil's in the details if, if there is any benefit to it. And then we can't, we can't rule out the, the notion that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's something else at, at play that uh, we're not giving things credit for. And that goes for some of the things that, that we advocate for as well. You know, like I've done... I've done things before um, or even recommended things before uh, to some of my lifters that I really do think works well, but uh, you could make an argument that, that it doesn't. For example, one thing that we do, uh, we rotate our, our supplemental exercises uh, weekly. You know, so we'll have, a, say, a, a couple options and we'll kind of switch back and forth between them weekly. Well, I think that's a, a better way to do things. Uh, there are other people who disagree with that. I see their point of view. Um, I mean, I do it the way that I do it because I think it works, but I, at the same time, I have to concede that I could be wrong on it, you know. So maybe, maybe that's uh, kind of what's going on in some of those situations. <laughs> It's you know what what I what I just to kind of just elaborate on that too. It's just I, I mean I think we have to be clear on if we're talking about say for ourselves versus the um, you know the the training population at large and or or versus the the outliers the the people that are just strong no matter what they were just they were they were born that way and and they're and they're just they're just good at this um, and and what I find happens a lot people come to this gym and they say well if this person can do it why can't I do it and you know it's just it doesn't quite work that way and so sometimes what, we, what we'll do here is we'll we'll start with something very basic and then we can kind of build on it um, and it's easier to add in a little bit um, as as we see how somebody responds to a type of training, but but what I, what I find, especially in this, with everything online and everything so immediately accessible, um, is that people want to compare themselves continuously to the best in the world, and you know, I, I find myself on a regular basis telling them that they are not the best in the world. Maybe they can be one day, but <laughs> not not now, not now at all. Yeah, well, I think that's a really interesting point as well. That um, if you look at top lifters in the world, no two lifters train exactly the same way. You know, even if you look at successful coaches, you know, uh, Coach Shaco comes to mind that he's trained many world champions, you know, and it's interesting to hear him talk about uh, the, the different lifters that he's trained at the top. You know, uh, this lifter could tolerate massive amounts of volume, you know, but this other lifter couldn't, you know, this other lifter did better on higher intensities. Now, all of his training programs, if you just look surface deep, uh, they all look very similar, you know, but um, clearly there are differences, and if you dig into them a bit more, you know, those differences show up and they, they come out. And a good coach is going to dial those things uh, uh, to suit the lifter. Um, the interesting thing is to get the principles right so that you have the minimum amount of guesswork possible, I think. Yeah, I would agree. So we're uh, starting to run a bit short on time. I wanted to get to one last question uh, before we close things up. So do you guys tend to try uh, try new things? We're talking about experiments, obviously. So do you tend to try these things out on yourself first? Or, uh, you know, if you have something you think it might be a good idea, do you go ahead and just... Uh, jump in and, and give it a shot with uh, some of your clients? Uh, do you feel like there's a requirement one way or another? Yeah, I'll, I'll go in and chime in on this one. Um, yeah. So, so you remember a couple months ago I brought up using a slingshot in my bench training, which I think, by the way, has helped a significant amount 
with with my bench progress. Um, I actually recommended to my client the other day that that she go and get a slingshot, and she was definitely open to it. So I'm I'm hopeful that you know she'll get one and and we'll incorporate it into you know appropriate portions of the next training cycle, and we'll see some good progress. Yeah. So you're of the mind that that you need you needed to try it first before you uh, recommend it. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't think I'd be a good coach if I if I didn't try it first with before I recommended. Ah, oh, just I'll just do this well willy nilly and see how the shit goes, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm kind of torn because on one on one end, yeah, you need to. You know, there's a lot that you can learn by trying something first, but I don't want, um, I don't want, a, you know, if, if I fail an experiment, if uh, if I try something and it doesn't work for me, I don't want, want that to then hinder uh, the progress of one of my lifters. You know, one thing that comes to mind, and this really wasn't an experiment in the strictest sense, but um, I've coached Mark Robb for a lot of years, and uh I talked earlier about how I don't really care for reverse bands. And in fact, I think they're generally a bad idea. But Mark uh, was pretty insistent that he had done them and he liked them. They they worked well for him. So eventually I relented and, and included those in his programming. And, I mean, he was right. I kind of had to, to take stock on, you know, kind of reassess my beliefs, I guess, you know, um, he was right that that did work better for him. So, I mean, if I had, you know, just uh, continued my insistence, I guess, and, and written off reverse bands for everybody in all uh, all circumstances, that may not have gone so well, you know? So, yeah, I would, I would have to kind of, I found for myself that certain things are worth, um, experimenting with uh and it really depends on on you know how much how much potential damage <laughs> we could do to the lifter if uh you know whether or not we're, we're experimenting uh, on ourselves first or we put something out there um and, and i think i think an advantage in my part which allows me to say maybe experiment with with something Rather than you know, for on on a lifter first before I do it on myself, is that we're right there to watch them, so we're yeah. we're right there to see, make sure that there's you know we can we can just stop, we can just immediately if there's if there's an issue, um, but but I I think it's a I think it's a mixed bag, whether or not um, I experiment on myself first or I. Um, or I, or I put something out there for the lifters. And, and then the last thing is that just sometimes I don't have the luxury of experimenting on myself if I'm in the middle of a training cycle, and I don't want to disrupt my own training cycle um, to, to try out something new or a new rep scheme or something like that. So it, I might have to just go ahead and, and throw it out there and just see how it works for the lifters. Yeah. Man, Man how do you feel about this? Yeah, the, the only thing I was going to add to that, I, I actually agree with everything that's been said. I totally am tracking with what Adam said. I mean, kind of from an ethical perspective, um, you know, sometimes I would prefer to experiment with something on myself, um, you know, beforehand just to know if it's feasible or, or uh, you know, to determine whether or not I think it's a, it's a good idea. I mean, sometimes you've got to test drive the car, so to speak, to, you know, see if this is, is a workable um, you know, ex experiment, if you will. But then other times, I mean, I don't feel the need to do that. Like Paulie said, maybe I don't have the time because I'm in the midst of a, of a training cycle myself. Or, you know, I mean, I don't know, kind of using like a barber or hairstylist. I mean, you know, they're not going to shave their head bald, but they might think that that looks good on somebody else. So, I mean, and maybe that's, you know, not the greatest of examples, but it's, I mean, one of our jobs of the coach is to be able to, you know, determine and, and decipher that, you know, just kind of like a hairstylist would, you know, oh, wow, I think this might work for you, you know, and then, you know, someone tries it out and, and then, you know, provided, provided that they don't get hurt, I mean, you know, an unsuccessful experiment is, is not necessarily a bad thing, right, because when you have 
a fork in the road, sometimes you have to go down the wrong path to, to find the right one. So at least that's how I look at things. And there yeah, might be. I think that goes back to what. Sorry, I, I think that goes back to to what Adam was saying about, um, you know, the good mornings and and does that help you later down the road? I mean, I think for that particular example, it didn't. But you know, the larger point is not not lost on me. Right. You know, I think that um, one thing that that I see with RPE training, you know, sometimes people will come back. I, I will have told them to do a nine RPE and they'll come back and say, well, I got two reps, but I missed the third. Well, how, how did you miss the third if you were only supposed to go to a nine RPE? <laughs> so, well, I mean, it was yeah. a mistake. You know, obviously it was a mistake. So um, I, don't get, I don't get too worked up about it because although it might be less than optimal for, for that particular training session, as long as they learn something from it, next time they'll be a little more accurate with their RPE. So yeah. There's still an improvement that that happened, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, provided that, that they learn something from it, uh, and and I think that's, you know, very much the the same type of thing. Yeah, as long as you're not hurting your lifters. I mean, that's, I think that's like the big, one of the big uh, no-nos. Like you, you really shouldn't be <laughs> causing injuries to your lifters. So some are going to happen, I suppose, uh, but. You know, if you've got a pattern of, of hurting people, then that's not okay. Right. Agreed. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, well, so, the, so well, the, we can all agree that hurting people is not what we're here for. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know. You're a, you're a bunch of disagreeable people, but uh, <laughs> at least we can agree on that, right? Well, how about this? We, we, we try not to hurt them physically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The uh, the emotional pain of, of of some of the programming. If we're programming some high volume stuff, you know, we have to. I, I guess as it still comes back to us as coaches, that we still have to hear about it. Man, I see that on the the RTS Facebook page quite a bit. People will, uh, will post pictures of their workout. Like, what did I do wrong? <laughs> what did I do to make Mike mad? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Any time there's repeats at eight. That's that's right. that's that's when it happens. Or sometimes like four. Yeah, it's all day. it's all good fun. Yeah. <laughs> and if it makes anyone feel any better, I feel that way about my own training as well. Like I I write my own training, and there are times when I'm I go down to the gym and I look at what I'm supposed to do for that day, and I'm like, why did I do this to myself? <laughs> this is going to be terrible. <laughs> Have you ever hilarious. thought about yeah. getting a coach, Mike? Maybe you need one. Um, I'm uh. <laughs> It would probably be helpful, but uh, I would have to relinquish control for that to happen, and I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. <laughs> and then uh, the next question, Mike, is who would that coach be? Oh, oh, man. <laughs> you don't have to – I'm not I'm not putting you on the hook today to answer that, but uh, – Right, no topic yeah. for no day. All right, let's yeah. close this thing out. <laughs> 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 no, uh Seriously, though, that is about all the time that we have, so I do get to, to dodge that question. But that, that is a good question. We should talk about that sometime. Um, yeah, but before we do uh, close everything out, as we we have been, I'm going to remind everybody again about the Fort Lauderdale seminar. This thing is going to be awesome. So we talked a little bit about deadlifting today, and Matt, who's here with us today, uh, was talking about some of his thoughts on deadlift training He's going to have a whole presentation about that. Uh, Matt's got some really unique ideas about deadlift training, or I mean, unique to uh, to most of us uh, in the in the powerlifting world. So um, they they work too. They produce. Uh, he's produced some good deadlifters. So uh, that presentation itself will be really uh, really interesting. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, there's a bunch of others too. Dr. Zordos is going to do one on integrating periodization. Uh, integrating periodization methods, uh, which is going to be very interesting. Uh, I've got uh, a few presentations. You can check out the full schedule on the RTS uh, website. Uh, we've got it. We've got the whole thing up. You can get tickets and uh, you know get the address, the dates, the times, the full schedule, speaker bios, and and so on. So if you haven't already, definitely check that out. If you're in the area or willing to go to 
God forbid, Fort Lauderdale uh, in May. It, <laughs> you know, it's going to be awesome. It'll be awesome weather. It'll be an, an awesome time. You make a vacation out of it. Uh, learn about lifting, lift some weights, and and then go to the beach. You know, hey, whatever. So uh, that's about all the time that we've got. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Uh, thanks, Polly, Matt, and Adam for hanging out and, uh, and talking about experiments with me. And, uh, yeah, that's about all we've got, so we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> <laughs>